Yes, so uh, welcome at Xevia. I'm not going to talk long about uh, Xevia. I'm, uh, my name is Kenny Baas. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm an uh, employee at Xevia and I'm a consultant uh, focusing mostly on continuous delivery and test automation, which is not about test automation in my opinion, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. So what I'm going to talk about first is failing and how I got into the IT. And you might know this, Pentium 2, Pentium 3. So this is where it started for me uh, when I was eight, 10 years old. My dad bought me this machine and it was really fun. I played a lot of Red Alert 2 with it. But what I also did was play with it, try to get to know the system trial and error. So any one of you heard about F-Disk? Yeah. yeah. So I tried that. I failed miserably. <laughs> yeah. Everything got erased. But that's actually a good thing. My dad actually had his own company where he had an IT administrator and he could fix it for me. So I sat next to him and he showed me, yeah, you did this and this. And then I learned. And I learned the hard way because it means when I came home on Friday and I did the F-Disc, I couldn't play Red Alert 2 until Monday. So yeah, I learned the hard way. And, but this actually got me into the IT, learning. And I think this as, um, I'm an engineer now, a software engineer mostly. So I consult in software engineering quality. And for me, software development is quoted by Alberto Brandolini. It's actually, it's about learning. So I learned, to, I learned about the system by failing. And a side effect was that I understood PC in the end. So without failing, I wasn't able to notice. <coughs> so that represents me as an uh, engineer. So what do you think is one of the most effective stuff, the effective way of learning? I just said it. Breaking thing. Yeah. So this is actually a book. I can advise this to everyone. It's about black box thinking. And it's the paradox of if you want to win, you have to fail. That's strange. But it's the truth, actually. So this goes on about uh, the, this book goes in about failing. So it explains about the airplane business and the hospital business. The airplane business is really good at failing and learning because, yeah, it is open about failure. It's really open about failure. And there's another uh, side, another yeah, method that has this incorporated, and that's actually science. <coughs> science is really good at failing. It has incorporated in their in their system. So they come up with a hypothesis. They check it. And they learn from it. So the hypothesis would be water. Water boils at 100 degrees, right? Well, when you're at this altitude, yeah. But when you're on higher altitude, no. But it was first the rule, and then someone broke the rule, and now they learned that on higher altitude, it doesn't. So science is really the thing that, in my opinion, we fail to do in the software engineering today. And continuous delivery is a part of s switching to that mode, to this mode of planning, doing, checking, and acting. This is what, in my opinion, continuous delivery is all about. And Dave Farley himself, who was a co-author of the book, says so too. So let's look at the situation currently at, at work. I mostly work in the enterprise world. And you ever heard of KPIs? Yeah. 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 This is really strange because, in my opinion, it doesn't work really to improve. Um, because let's set some KPIs for you in the next year. So either you go high, you have a high goal, and you fail. But what do you get? You don't get your bonus, you don't get your added value. So what you do? We're going to set low goals. So actually, KPIs will get you into mediocrity. Because people who don't set the goals high but low, they win for them and they get money or bonuses. Yeah. So where does this come from actually? It's something 
has to do with return of invest. It's all about return on investment. General Motors is really good. So our culture comes from General Motors, who in that time uh, was in a high market, the car industry. So they could say, well, okay, if we do this, how many cars do we get? Because we know if you sell this, you get a lot of cars back. That was, they earned a lot, but it doesn't work today anymore because there's a story about Kodak. Whoever heard about Kodak? Who uses Kodak now? <laughs> so what did Kodak do wrong? Well, they started with cameras and at some point they got a patent for the digital camera. It was somewhere around the 70s, really early. They didn't use it. They didn't think it was going to use because what was the question they asked? What will be our return on investment? Nobody could answer it because nobody was doing it. So you cannot answer this question. So they think, okay, this is not interesting. So later on in the 90s, digital came a bit higher and there was one management of the board who thought, I'm going to do this, but nobody supports me. I'm going to do it in Japan, in some faraway country where nobody ever comes. And he almost succeeded on doing it, but then he got caught, and they fired him. And guess where he went? Apple. We, I think we all know what happened. So this is the story of Kodak about not improving. And there's one company, and that's not a book I advise you to read, and this is what my talk mostly is about, is Toyota Kata. Toyota is really good at this improvement. So they're not checking for the return of investment, but they're doing it like this guy went to Apple and what, what they're gonna ask, okay, what problem are you fixing? What's your goal? What do you solve? So that's called the Toyota Kata. And to explain, let me get some. So whoever heard of the Toyota Kata? Oh, great. So I'm gonna explain it a bit over here. I think this is the best way. No, I'm gonna do it here. So, given you're here and you look around you, and you might ever have you ever been on this planning session to see how we can improve? And then you come up with all these stories, right? All these things, tasks on the board which we can improve on. Have anyone been into this one? Does the product manager come in? What can we improve? Yeah. So. Then we take, take this one on and we take this one on, but without a vision, without a goal, we don't know where we're going. Because if we do this, who says we're improving the correct way? So what, in, what Toyota does is actually set a big audacious goal, a vision. For instance, at Toyota, we want 100% customer service. 100% um, how do you say it? I forgot the word. Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Thank you. So they want 100%, which is an extreme goal. But if you work towards it, they say it will happen. So around here is your vision, which you know how you can improve. And around here is a big cloud fog with all these things we can improve, but we don't know how to improve. So these are the low hanging fruits and they're easily settled. Over. So what they're saying, try to set the next target. So for instance, what is our current? condition, it's now 91%, let's go to 92%. So they're saying 92%. And then they know for that, we're going to try this, we're going to try this, and we're going to try this, and we're going to try this, and that way we're going to hopefully come to the target. And then we set our next, and we set our next, and well, we will never exceed that going to the goal, but the goal is there, so we try to keep improving. And that's actually um, how it goes. It's about this. It's about understanding the direction, grasping the current condition, so, and then establishing the target condition and iterate. And this is what, in my opinion, is continuous delivery is all about. So how you do that is with an A3. They also call it an A3. Maybe some of you heard of it. So you focus process, your challenge, you check your condition now, you check your target, and then you're just gonna do the iteration in scientific mode. How I call it scientific. <coughs> so let's look now at what's going on in engineering today. So I, my study was electrotechnics and electronics. 
So there's a Dutch thing which rhymes, not in English poorly, it's called meten is weten. So measuring is knowing. That's the first thing you learn. So we measure everything. <coughs> now let's look at the current tooling we have supporting DevOps and continuous delivery. So I come on a lot of businesses and they say, well, yeah, we use Git, we use Jenkins, we use this, we use that. Okay, that's perfect. But what is the measurement in it? How fast do you go from one point to another? So we never measure anything, not even in the business. So the business can say, well, we're going to do this, and then you do it, and then nobody's actually measuring if it was worth delivering it. Is that, do you come by this too? That, that you're just actually golfing in the blind? And yes, that's Justin Bieber, it's the only picture I could find from someone golfing in the blind. Yeah, it was the only one who was doing it actually. But yeah, in, in his book about black box thinking, he's saying, if we don't learn from our failure, we're actually golfing in the blind because we're just shooting and you don't know where it lands and you just walk to the pothole and you don't see it, okay, let's try again. But you don't know where it went. So you're actually golfing blind. And in my opinion, continuous delivery without measurement is not continuous delivery. You're actually golfing blind. You're not learning. You're not improving on your continuous delivery. And this is actually what continuous delivery is mostly my opinion about. And S Steve Smith wrote a brilliant book about it, which is still writing it. It's on Limpa. So speed is essential because there's an opportunity cost associated with not delivering software. So what you want is that the business gets, it ID, gets an ID, and you want it as fast as possible to production so they can check if the ID is worthwhile. And if they analyze it and they see how oh, this works, then we're going to do it. <coughs> Doesn't it work? We're not going to do it. And you want it so cost efficient, so, so fast as possible. Because that way we learn. And in, that's why continuous delivery was actually uh, made. So, as Steve says, this continuous delivery is when stability and speed are insufficient. So, about his book. So, anyone heard about Steve Smith, by the way? No. Okay. You should follow him. He is, uh, he's an English guy, and he has a brilliant talk about measuring continuous delivery. And he says, yeah, we need to measure our continuous delivery. It, you can get so far with automating your build process, but does, do you really improve? You might be stable, more stable, but did you actually improve? So this is the question for you, where you work. Do you encounter the same? Do you know how long it takes from a story being brought up to production? Do you know now? Yeah? Mm -hmm. If you know, then it's really good. Keep it up. Mm -hmm. um, but this measuring is like this. Continuous delivery measurement is actually th two parts, stability and throughput. Stability is the change failure rate and the failure recovery time. And the throughput is the lead time and frequency. And you can put that in several parts of your pipeline. So, let's build a small pipeline. So, usually a pipeline begins with code. Build. An acceptance test and deploy. This is an easy one. Sounds familiar? What we're actually not doing in this pipeline is measuring, I got a user story, so an ID, and how long does it take for the code? So this is actually something that's not being discussed at the moment, not in this book. <coughs> so what is, what is this throughput and what is this stability? So throughput, you can measure on multiple parts. You can measure it on deployment, you can measure it on your line. You can measure it on your build, on your code, and on your use story. Stability is hard for your use story, but for the rest, you can actually 
measure stability. So what is it about? Let's see, change failure rate plus failure recovery time. So change failure rate is the amount of failures you're doing in here. So if we deploy something, how much does it fail over sort over amount of time? So that's part one. And failure recovery time, so how long does it take for us to recover? So if this breaks, what are the numbers over the amount of time? Then we recover, and that's the recovery rate. And if you do this for every stage of your pipeline, you're actually <coughs> measuring how fast you can go. And with these measurements, you grasp your current condition in the improvement cut. So what you can say then is actually grasping your current condition and say, well, what we want to do is the current condition is we go to production one time every three weeks. Now let's go that to one time every two weeks. So now all of these data that's here, you can put in your current condition. So you put it here and then you say, okay, in order to go to two weeks, we need to, well, maybe we need to do this better. So let's do, instead of once every five days, let's go once every one day. So what, what happens now is you can do tests. So one test can be either TDD, for instance, or some other part, and you can experiment actually. And you can see if the thing you're doing actually makes sense and actually helps of improving your continuous delivery. So here's another part, and that's if you run into any problems. So why can't you do TDD? That you're gonna solve here. And a perfect example is what we're doing nowadays is General Motors or any other car company except Toyota, when they see a problem in their pipeline, they're gonna resolve it after the pipeline. And that's what we're actually doing mostly in corporate. You have a product manager who has a KPI of delivering, so what is his only target? Delivery. So if he runs in a problem, he says, well, we fix it later. What Toyota does is actually shuts the pipeline down and looks for the problem in the pipeline. So they do everything to constantly improve. If that means that we can't deliver, okay, that doesn't matter. We can take a bit of hit and then we stay stable. So instead of delivering here and have big success here and then go down because <coughs> shit hits the fan because afterwards we cannot fix it anymore. Toyota is actually being stable over the last couple of 20, 30 years, something like that. And yeah, you see where the rest of the car industry is going. So, is this doable now with the current tooling you have? Do you think this is doable to constantly measure these throughputs and these stability and have one dashboard? Well, we can build ourselves, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, we can build it ourselves. We can go to the deployment stability from the issue tracking, from the deployment pipeline, from the build system. Mm -hmm. So you can build it yourself, mm -hmm. of course. But actually GitLab and Visual Studio Code are actually doing this already for you. And that's what I'm going to show you. Mm -hmm. GitLab. Who works with GitLab at the moment? Great. Who works with Visual Studio Code? Perfect, I, I love them both, but since I'm a Java developer, I love them. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna show you now. So anyone who works, everyone who works with GitLab ever tried the issue tracking in GitLab itself? Are you using that right now? Perfect, that's good. Experimentation, I love it. So that's what I'm doing at my current uh, company where I consult to just experiment and see how it goes. And that's why I'm showing now. Can you zoom in a little bit? Sorry? Can you zoom in a little bit? Yeah, I will zoom in. So this is GitLab. Uh, who of you knows GitHub? 
well, GitLab is basically the same, but improved, in my opinion. So, we're in GitHub, you need to go to Travis. Here you have a building pipeline. So you still have the same, right? You have your repository, you have your issue tracking, you have your merge requests, your pipelines, your wiki, etc., etc. Does anyone have questions about these tabs that they don't know about? Okay, so let's see. Uh, this is the pipeline feature, which is built in. And here you can actually see every pipeline that's being built in GitLab. And this, if you click on it, you can see the pipeline visually. So this is a small, simple pipeline I just built for today. Um, this is the community edition. So everything is already in here, only slower, mostly. <coughs> than, so you can get GitLab on-prem or in the cloud on-prem. That's what we do at uh, my current uh, job. And this is all scripted like Travis does it. Everyone worked with Travis before? Okay, so let's start with that. So you have, it's just, uh, you work with Jenkins? Anyone work with Jenkins before? So what you usually do is you, this is your GitLab CI, YAML or YML, I'm not sure how you pronounce it in the States. In here you can set your stages and you can script. So I have a build, an automated acceptance stance and a deploy stage. So in my build, <coughs> I just run my scripts. And for this, this is a AWS Lambda with an AWS Gateway application, a small one, where I just say, well, I say to NPM, just run my build, make that Lambda packageable and test it so I can later publish it to the cloud. So that's, that's actually the base of the pipeline. Questions about this? Does this is still sound easy, hard? So this is basically my whole deployment script or my pipeline script mm -hmm. in one script. So for GitLab to work, you have something called cycle analytics. And it's not perfect yet the way I described it here, but it's a real good start. So you have these multiple stages. The first one is issue. And the first one, issue is about, okay, the moment an issue is committed into GitLab, till the moment it is planned. So for a sprint, or for a bug, or etc., etc. So this is this stage. You see it's about two hours. So it's giving you instant throughput in that stage, in that first stage you see here. So this is instant. It gives you up to date. Second one is plan. So I planned it. How fast do I code it? So there's actually one stage in GitLab in between that says how fast does it go on the sprint? And then how, fa how fast do I code for this issue? That's this planning stage. So coding is actually when does it get into the main line. So I'm a trunk-based developer. I don't like feature branching, only if it's short-lived for a day, but I always go out of the master branch. So this is for me hopefully the same, mostly, almost. So when does an issue get on my main line? Test is strange, in my opinion. Test is actually how fast does my pipeline run? So the stuff I just showed you, the pipeline gets triggered on the master branch or on any branch, and it runs. So this delta is how fast <coughs> does this go? So mostly it's your automated acceptance test that takes the most time. So then it's the review part, and this is also something I don't do, because if you do stuff like uh, extreme programming, you sitting next to each other, you don't actually need reviewing. It's a false risk management thing, in my opinion, but we can talk about that in the break. And staging is actually when does it get into your acceptance? So to show to your customer. And you want to see something manual. And then production is actually when this is the whole line. So this is the whole main line. So what is lacking here? 
is the stability. So that's not yet in. But because everything is recorded in this data, you can easily fetch it out. If you have something on-prem, you can actually make it yourself. So that's perfect. As long as you have this in one streamline, it's easy to make it yourself. So the, the stability is also about each of these stages and is in this. So yeah, this, how does this sound? Nice? Yeah, I see quite some, some differences, of course. So, so to how do you measure this time? Yeah. If, if, the, if uh, an this issue is created yeah. at the end of the day, and you only start working on it the next day, yeah, of course, there's no lag. <laughs> yeah, that relevant. So that's the problem. It's still, uh, it's still just in. I think this is version 9 and this is 8. So you can only measure it in 30 to 90 days. Mm -hmm. But you can imagine how fast they can go to building this up. Yeah. And you can go into the database and do it yourself, of course, but it's actually a tool that can do it already for you. So like I said, it's not perfect yet, but it already gets you towards that point. So yeah, that's an issue I still have. Measuring the duration of, of the pipeline steps, that's easy. Mm -hmm. but, but you say is it valuable? That's the question. The things that are valuable there, uh, no, this is already valuable. You yeah. what, what do you mean? No, the, the, the time it takes to actually code, like the, the yeah. creative things. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's that, 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 that's harder to measure. Maybe that's a new Well, it is measurable. So what you want to measure is your whole pipeline. Mm -hmm. And you want to measure mm -hmm. from the, the point you're... The, your product owner puts the use story in, or yourself, or anyone, until you start coding for that issue. So if that takes long, mm -hmm. why does it take long? So it's not to put in a KPI on this, because that would be not good, but it's about how can we improve on it? So why does it take so long? And what can we do about it to improve it? Yeah. And this sounds, again, if you give it to a manager, mm -hmm. You will throw in KPIs to this. Yeah. And that's not what you want. So be careful with the Toyota Kata that you're not getting in that KPI. That's why it's in my talk, the KPI. Don't do it. It's horrible because it doesn't improve. But it's about the story behind mm -hmm. this. That's why I told the story about the computer at first, why I failed. It's not, it's not that I failed that was bad, but why did I fail? Because I didn't understand and I need to learn. You understand? Yeah, I'm still, I'm still trying to get. You, you drew that picture with the uh, uh, sort of situation yeah. where we are now. There's some ideas yeah. about what we can improve, but if we only put a, uh, a dot at the horizon, we we can choose like, to go in that direction. So we actually do some yeah. meaning. And then, is it okay to just move in the right direction? Yeah, sure. And it, you can even fail. If you're not moving in the right direction, yeah. then you should know because you measured it, but that's the whole deal. It doesn't matter. Try not to be concerned with how much the check you approve. No, that's not no, never concerned about that. But no. because of this model, you can check if you're improving okay. in a correct, correct way. So yeah. like a vision can be, I want to go to production each second, which is horrible for a project. You will mm -hmm. never make it, maybe, <coughs> but measure it and see if you're improving on it. Mm -hmm. And don't fail that you, like a KPI can be like, yeah, I want to, in half a year, I want you to go to production each five hours. Well, we cannot say that. But with a KPI, you put a target. Yeah. And with this kata, you put some thoughts on the horizon that so far you're never going to reach it. So yeah. You're not going to stop, stop when you cross, cross the border. No, you right? set a you're new target. Yeah. You set small targets yeah, yeah, and yeah. then move forward. Yeah. And then when you think, well, this is enough, then you set a new vision. So you don't try to reach a target. No, you just have it in mind. So you, you, yeah. you're yeah. solving the correct problems yeah. and not working around it. Yeah, yeah. otherwise you try to like, free optimize it. You do some premature optimization to get to your target, but then yeah. you forget the rest of it. So yeah, and then you yeah. maybe get something. So for this, actually, there's something that needs to be done in GitLab. And it's for an engineer like me, I don't want to do a lot. I'm a lazy developer. I don't. I just want that stuff to do it automatically, mm -hmm. and it almost does. It 
it needs to have, well, we're all engineers, so it needs to have some point that it knows where it is. So I'll show you. So when you go inside here, and the problem is it's the community edition. So it doesn't update fast. But if you have the enterprise edition, it will update almost instantly. So normally you have a title like uh, this is a fun user story, for instance, and you write something here. And this is something uh, everyone can do, and then you submit an issue. That, that's what's happening first. Now I've submitted the issue. At some point, you're going to refine this, and at some point, you're going to put it in a sprint. And in GitLab, there's two ways to do this. First is, what is this? Is it a bug or a user story? So you can edit the label. You can say, OK, this is a user story. If I do this, now it's planned. So now it's the second reading. Or you can put it to a milestone, so a sprint. That's the second part. So each one of these will trigger this. So, but that's something as a engineer, you know, doesn't matter. So what happens now? I got an issue number four, and let's go to some coding. And it doesn't matter what <coughs> happens here, so I can say, uh, I, and at some point I want to commit this. So for you not knowing this, this is git kraken. And what I need to do this, and this is important to be able to match everything, you say I am busy working on number four. And it's the number four. That's the only thing you need to do as a developer. So I can commit this and I can push this. It will take something. This is the community edition, and let's update it. And you see, I mentioned this, it's still open. My pipeline will probably run now because it's trunk based development, you know. So my pipeline will run. I'll actually cancel it for now. So now it measured this. So the third part is actually. I'm going to add something new. It's the closing part. And that is actually either closes or fixes. Or fixes. So these two things is the only thing as a developer you need to do. In my opinion, not a lot. Really easy, right? And I don't have to worry anything anymore about Jira updating my issue. Anyone? working with Jira or ServiceNow and every time you forget to update your user story and then the product order comes in or the boss, uh, scrum master, hey, why didn't you update it? Now I don't have my measurements. Use this. And let's see. Let's go to the issue. And now it says I closed it. So actually if you go to my issues, and you see open, you see it has problems updating, but actually I have one open. And when I go to close, you see this is a fun user story, it got closed. And that's actually this part. So I, now the pipeline is going to run. So I'm going to show you that. And here's another problem with GitLab this doesn't update automatically. Really annoying, we're trying to fix it, but sometimes it, it updates once in a while. But when I go here, <coughs> You can actually see it executing, and since this is the, don't be shocked, this is the community edition, so everything is free, but slow. But it's still faster than EBM. Okay. So now it just works, and this is the pipeline, and now everything is done, actually, for this stage. So this is the test. Now it will update the test, which is really nice. So review. So review is a tricky one, like I said, I'm a trunk-based developer, I don't do merge commits, but if you work on a branch, who doesn't know about merge requests here? Everyone? Good. So that's the last stage. So that, that's something that gets measured too, the reviewing part, the merge request. So how fast is it? So when you do merge requests, I advise you not to do, but when you do, it measures that too, which is nice. So staging, this is something that's also been done automatically, but staging is actually in your
in your YML, GitLab has different environments you can set. So like anything you want. But there's one environment that triggers the staging, and that's the environment with name production. If you set this, and this is run, then it will automatically update it. And that's basically it. So I've done maybe two things as a developer extra, and I don't need to meddle anymore with Jira, or ServiceNow, or Trello, or anything that's not included. And everything now gets measured. Like I said, it's not perfect yet, but it's getting over there. And this is fun, because now I can see, and I can watch this, and I can check to colleagues, hey, what are we doing wrong? We're committing code every two days. That's not continuous integration. What's the matter? Why aren't we doing this? Hey, our test is taking really long. How can we improve on this? So that's actually using the improvement kata with GitLab, within GitLab, and measuring continuous delivery. So let's check. Do you look from the perspective of the developer at this improvement, or do you look from the perspective of, say, a product team? Both. Okay. I'm an engineer, so I look, when I get a solution, I look from my own perspective, because I'm an engineer and I don't want to do a lot, I'm lazy, yeah. so I want to script everything. So you have good lazy developers and bad lazy developers, the good ones are actually improving stuff that gets scripted so i want to have it good yeah. in google they put engineers on the infra part because everything that's being done manual twice or gets scripted yeah. they make it better so that's that's my first part it doesn't need to bug the engineer mm -hmm. i don't want because i'm an engineer i'll shoot myself uh, for that but um and it doesn't work mostly. I never update Jira <coughs> or ServiceNow correctly, actually. And my intention is to do it, but I almost always forget because for me it's a manual thing that, that I repeat, 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 repeat. And I'm like, what, what am I doing, what? And this is, in my opinion, also what's happening with Agile transformation. Mm -hmm. Like with ServiceNow and everything, it gets, it's get, the upper level wants this, the service now and the better integration. And I'm like, good story, fine for you, but how does it help me as in the team? And that's why I come in as consulting. So where I am now, they're also implementing service now. And the first thing I ask is, okay, I want to GitLab integration. So whenever you, that's fine for your measurement above in the whole management layer, and if you want to measure that, be my guess, but don't bug us about it as a team. So to recap, the most important part for me is failing is actually for winners. So try to fail, but in control. So never, f so you don't actually go snowboarding without and go from the black piece without ever having experience. That would be stupid. Mm -hmm. So have a bit of common sense when you fail and try to do it in control. Uh, science with the improvement kata, so try it out for yourself. At least the, at least the mindset, it's already a beginning, it's already a good start. But I, use the, the, I want to use this because it's visual and people can just walk in and see how far we are. So start measuring, like I said, mate is way, that's Dutch. Uh, and GitLab is a nice starting point, but it's not perfect yet. And if you need more, you can just go into the database if you're not using Community Edition and you can grab the data out yourself. Uh, Steve Smith has a perfect example in his book LeanPub. I would advise you to read it. He actually did this without GitLab, but at 60 departments in England, and their uh, government departments. And you know they're a bit uh, behind. Well, I'm not saying behind, but because of politics. But he actually did this really perfect at 60 teams at the government in England. And what he did was take the current tooling and get all the data out by himself the first time. And then 
make some nice measurement and showing, look, this, this happened to your team. And then he put in a consultant and he says, this consultant is going to help you fix that problem. Why are you doing, why is this happening? Why is this happening? So read the book. It's really, it's really, really nice. It's on LeanPub. It's not finished yet, but there's no other data. So, any more questions before we go to the break? I saw experience with uh, other tools like uh, Jira. Yeah, Jira for me is a plugin hell. Uh, yeah, you can. I think you can integrate most of the stuff with Jira. All ages ago, I think you can do the same closest fixes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's doable, but I don't like it actually. I think your orchestration tools should be covering the whole part and Visual Studio Code and GitLab is exactly going that way mm -hmm. and Jira with Atlassian is doing it but not how I would want it because they're saying well yeah whenever you have a new issue you create a branch and I'm not saying no I'm not going to create a branch I'm just posting on master and their, their in point is I need to abide by their rules and I don't like that I don't like Atlassian for that to be honest but it's great yeah it's a good tool but that's my experience. Same for you, or Delta Lloyd uses, or are you using it? Yes, it's the same for me. It's quite complex. Yeah, well, at least that's how they implement it. Yeah, what I usually see at corporates is that they all got these socks measurements, yeah. and then they put it into Jira, so I really need to go from this stage to this stage and this stage, and I'm like, I just want to code and I was I was just I just want to say here I did something with this and now it's closed and that's everything I want to do so yeah do you see companies struggling with the part of actually like coming up with definitely changes to push several times a day to production because we're always talking about the technical part of it and how to do that and uh, yeah and I'm wondering actually as a product owner Get many features to go to actually push that by several times mm -hmm. to uh, a day to product. Because what I see is usually business struggles more with just like defining what the hell the next release of the application should be mm -hmm. yeah. than the developer struggling with like getting that into production. Yeah, that's what I see too. But then I have another talk about specification by example and domain driven design. Where actually at my current job I'm doing both, so I'm helping the the, the product owner and to get better scenarios out, and get easier scenarios out, so you get a ubiquitous language. And that really helps getting more ideas in. Because what I see happening is that because it's so slow, they think a lot about the issue because it takes long to get it into production. So that's why they're a bit shy and saying, I really need to get this correctly now. And they're not thinking about, okay, what if, what if this actually works? That's what I see. So it's, so I think engineers should run this way because it's easier for the engineer. For, for a developer, it's really nice to see it, in my opinion. Um, and at that point, you can start working on getting multiple features in. But mostly it's an orga organization problem how they divide their organization in different parts. So in a big utopia, yes, I think you need it. Uh, yes. yeah, what I've seen, I mean, tools like you are also used you know, for the product team you know, to groom the backlog and to, to add mm -hmm. more to the tickets before you can go to the development, right? A test case is possibly in Jira at the requirements and so on. And yeah, would you want to do that in GitLab? Or would you say, okay, we use what's some other tools to prepare our backlog and then it's ready for the team, and then you end up to get that file. How would you see that? Yeah, I'm not really a fan of after. putting too much in a user story. I'm more of a mindset person, where if someone comes up with an ID, we're gonna refine it. Because when business, sometimes I see business going at it with the user story, and then a business analyst comes in, and they go straight to the how. We're gonna do it in that database. We're gonna use that service. That's not the talk I want to have at a refinement. I just want to know the scenario. 
and think about it with with the three amigos. So you heard about behavior driven development? You have you have the three amigos, they say the tester, the domain expert and the engineer. You want them in a room. And if they if you have certain practices like specification by example, input output, everything like this, then they're already on the mindset that they know what the user story is. And some reference and some picture to that workshop is enough in my opinion. Because they know exactly what to build. And they can straight away make the acceptance criteria out of the scenarios. The scenarios are actually the acceptance criteria. <coughs> and then I don't think you all need this gibberish anymore. If you go fast enough, then all that is slowing you down. But that's my uh, opinion. <coughs> is that the sum? Yeah. I think for measuring, I'd start with bugs because there's nothing unclear about the stories or, or that kind of thing. If you have a bug, you know how this feature is supposed to work. Everybody understands that. It's just it needs to be fixed. And yeah. It needs to be fixed. Basically, the sooner the better. Yeah. Um, bugs is also. You can barely prioritize your bugs. Yeah. It's also saying something. If you have a lot of bugs, then probably you're yeah. not doing, you're not specifying it correctly. Yet, probably. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. I yeah, yeah. yeah. So trying to get very good at squashing bugs is maybe. You don't want that. Time. You're not solving the problem because yeah. actually, from research, yeah. there's research about TDD and yeah. about specification by example, mm -hmm. and actually, 70, 40 to 70 percent, something like this, or 75 percent of the bugs comes from not specifying correctly up front and not doing TDD. Mm. That's a lot. Yeah. And if you bring in continuous delivery, you come around 90, 95%. You should actually look at the failure rate of your stores, like how many stores yeah. return the defects. Yeah. That's something we're working on now too. So it's yeah. nice to have a feature and draw it in, but how? That mm. So anyone heard of Serenity? Yeah. yeah, it's really nice Serenity, where you can put in your user story, and then you can, it reports which user story is in and what is automatically tested. So a product owner can really see. But now the next step is actually to see if that user story is used mm. and how many bugs did that and why. Yeah. I want to know the why. Why did it happen? Yeah, yeah because if, if yeah. you take a scientific approach, you're, even with a user story, you might say, I don't know exactly what we need to do, but let's experiment. You know? Yeah. 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 But you need some tooling to. Yeah, do that experiment. Probably. So it's yeah. It's, uh, is, that, is that what it does? Is that is that what Serenity helps with? No, Serenity is only a reporting. It's oh. mostly a reporting tool and a, a screenplay pattern, which is the really next step between this Gherkin and your page objects or your REST API. There's a whole business language in between, so it helps you building your ubiquitous language. At some point, you have your report with your user stories in it and exactly <coughs> what it tested with screenshots or with, with calls. Yeah. And then a tester or a product owner can see it and it can actually say, well, this happened, but it didn't work correctly. And then you go sit next to a developer and you can instantly see it in the code. Yeah. And it's the same, it's a tool that helps the developer and not bugs him. Any more questions? Well, then we, ah, we we do that you know, that you account for developers. Uh, how do you deal with you know collaborating on tasks between different teams? You know, everybody pushes the trunk. Uh, how do you channel the changes? You know, if they're in flight and then how do people work on it? Yeah. So there's this one thing, and Dave Farley says it really nice. The engineering team is responsible for your acceptance test. So in my opinion, you have two stages. So you have your build stage, which is here. And this will take approximately five minutes. Yeah. So this is what Dave Farley actually says too. So this will take five minutes and you're working locally and locally you're building and then you're pushing it and then that pipeline will run and within five minutes you get your feedback. So after that, after the first commit, then it goes to your acceptance test actually. So it creates a possible release candidate in your repository and then it shoots to your, the rest of your pipeline. And that can take up to an hour. But in the meantime, and I think that's what you mean, the code stacks up on the master, right? Well, yeah, maybe people need to collaborate, right, to make it actually work. So, so if yeah. you just commit the master, you don't want to have time of getting all the time because the teacher may take two days, right? So, um, would you then, I mean, what would I guess you need to do feature flagging or something like that? Yeah. Is that something you want to do, or? Yeah, feature toggling is something you want to do, yeah. 
So actually, every code that, that you commit is actually code that can run to production. So if you don't want to s expose something, there's things as feature toggling. I would advise doing that for trunk-based development. So usually, really the, the, Git the Git flow stuff with the branches and the, the feature branches, that's actually, in my, in my opinion, something bad. Because you're not collaborating on master branch with each other. You're not doing continuous integration with each other. So you're not talking anymore. And in my opinion, trunk-based development, there, there is still feature branching, but it's short-lived, so max one day. That's it. So you want to keep it small. And then it's possible, but just one day. And the rest is just future branching, and it's a different way, and it's a different approach. But that's solving the problem. So if you cannot do that, then you probably have a design issue. You need to fix that design issue. Or a test, or a TDD issue, something like that. That's why I usually see in teams. They, have, they, have, they don't want to do trunk-based development because they're not sure if what they commit is correct. So that means their unit tests aren't sufficient enough to give them, give them enough, uh, what's it called? Confidence. confidence, thank you. Confidence to may be sure, almost sure that <coughs> their commit is doing it good to production. That's mostly the problem, and then I try to fix that and not go to future branch. But the problem with feature targeting is also how do you test them, right? I mean, do you, do you have to test the feature on, the feature off, and there are you know, unlimited combination of features yeah, on that you may want to test? So it depends. There's a lot of ways to do it, but that's a whole different yeah, talk. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah but there's diff different approaches to that. So you either test it, yeah, always test it. That's basically as you always test it if you're not sure. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, then, yeah. So in, in GitLab, you have the, uh, the time spent, and it uses the median. Yeah. Is that the correct way of uh, measuring it? Are there alternative ways? You have uh, at the moment, that's something GitLab doesn't mean. Yeah, it, it says 30 days or 30 days, but actually I want to see more. The median is really good, but the median is what you said. You need to say what it is. So your starting point and your end point. But now in GitLab, it's over 30 days. But the data is in, so you can pull it out yourself if you want to. Yeah, but I mean, instead of, instead of median, do you average, for example, or 95% of? Yeah, now it's doing average. So now it's doing the average over a median. If I understand you correctly, that's what you mean? No, no, no. Median is like you have a distribution, mm -hmm. you just take the middle one. So it's not the same as average. Yeah, OK. Now it's average. You now mean it's average. Mean. Yeah, that's what you want. You want the average one over a certain time. But on GitLab, it clearly says median. OK, so that, that's a good question. No, I, need to, I, I, need, I need to look I need to look into that. Yeah. But I'm more interested in is, is that. <coughs> Do you not want more information than just the median or the yeah. average? Yeah, you want a lot more information. That's why GitLab isn't sufficient yet. yet. <laughs> but you can get it out yourself. Right. And that's what you want to do, actually, <coughs> in the end. But this is, a perf this is a good starting point. But it's a good question. And I will surely look what they think. So I'm just shooting in issues now. Questions towards the team. Can you please update it? Or I'm going to do it myself soon. <laughs> Yeah, but with plugins, yeah. And I dislike to plugins. Correct. It can be done, yeah. And if it works, it works for you. Uh, yeah. As long as you, as long as you're doing it 
trying to go this way, then it's perfect. Then it's perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. As long as you go this way, then a tool is just a tool. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I just showed you an example in GitLab, because I work in GitLab. But yeah, Jira, y yeah, you can write it yourself too. But Jira has plugins yeah. for it. Yeah, but this my point is that it gives you, maybe it's the future of GitLab as well. But it just gives you this extra information that it yeah. creates a discussion. It starts a discussion between the engineers. Mm -hmm. what, why did this happen? And why are we far away from this yeah. goal that we push? Yeah, it's exactly that. If that works for you, yeah. do it. I'm not saying GitLab is the silver bullet or. And I'm especially not. I always make. I didn't even start it today, but I usually say this is not uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Because we all know what happened in Indiana Jones, everyone dies. So this is just the way. And yeah, if, if it's in Jira, I really love to see how it works. And if it works for you, we can discuss it. Uh, maybe. Of course. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Shall we start the break? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.